Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. And I'll say that uh, I'm going to discuss <laughs> The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. This was the nonfiction book I read uh, throughout May uh, for the maybe Midrash event. Uh, but there's been a lot of stuff going on, uh, especially this week here in the U.S. You know, we'd, we'd had a lot of stuff going on with our public health crisis, and things seemed to be on the right trend, and then, you know, horrific acts occurred uh, in the U.S. this week, and um, the tensions are rising. My, my younger brother actually lives in Minneapolis, so I've just been thinking about that a lot, and um, reading, and rereading, and rereading, and different, you know, translations and versions, Psalm 10, uh, from the Bible to kind of just keep my mind set and, and, tr and trying to, to stay on the right trajectory, the right path. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but, uh, William James. So William James is the older brother of Henry James and around, I think he was almost 60. Uh, he, he'd established himself as a major thinker in, uh, American psychology, U S psychology and sort of a father of psychology and he was given the opportunity to go to um, Edinburgh and he delivered a series of uh, like as a visiting lecturer visiting professor in 1901 and 1902 and he gave a series of 20 lectures and then and those were the varieties of religious experience that was sort of the title of this lecture seminar series he gave and he then took those lectures, he sort of revised them, he added extensive annotation and, and like footnotes that expanded his thinking, and that's where this book comes from. Now it's an interesting text, I know some people, uh, uh, about a week ago there was the whole debate around, you know, where, where do you stand on the, the spectrum of theism to atheism or agnosticism or uh, such, and within that discussion people were discussing the idea of transcendental experiences and um, that is primarily what this book is. It, is. it is primarily a, I would say over an eighth of the text is James taking primary source documentation uh, or immediate secondary source documentation of someone else's experiences, religious experiences, spiritual experiences, transcendental experiences, and he he builds those up as almost this mosaic to um, cre create these lectures. So he he pulls in thinkers from uh, not just from Christianity, but uh, from other religious uh, backgrounds, even from sort of like agnostic or or, or non-religious uh, backgrounds that are still spiritual backgrounds. He he just pulls all of these in and then he weaves them together in this mosaic or this tapestry. To, uh, to try and build a sense of, are religious experiences real? Are they valid? What do they mean? And he comes to a conclusion, it's, it's fascinating. He, sp <laughs> he spends you know, an extensive amount of time clarifying the idea that uh, the religious experiences and specifically transcendental personal religious experiences are valid for those who have them and, and really arguing that point extensively. And towards the end, he, he introduced this idea of even though those are personally valid for one individual, another person doesn't need to necessarily accept their authority if that person, you know, doesn't experience the same sensation, experience the same feeling and, and, and thought um, drawn together. And, and then he, pro he provided his conclusion, but then he gives this postscript at the end where he goes, I realized in lecture 20 when I was trying to sum everything up that I never really explained where I'm at on this. And he, he says, you know, if you divide into naturalists and supernaturalists, I'm on the supernaturalist side. Um, and so, so it's an interesting book overall. It, it is uh, about 500 pages. And um, if, if you're interested in trying to get into James's theory, you're going to be wading through a lot of you know, like I said, primary documentation, personal experiences that he digs into. Um, and and you, it might be better if you read sort of the first like three lectures and then the last two or three lectures um, at the end to, to sort of just get a general uh, feel for what he's actually saying and doing and, and, and constructing with all of these experiences that just fill the rest of the text. Um, I, I did find it quite thought provoking. So a couple of passages from there. 
Um, oh, and the other thing I want to mention is he does not really dig into apologetics or um, religious philosophy until the very, very, very end of the book. Um, he, he, what he explains is he's more, and he doesn't talk about like church systems or ecclesiastic systems or religious systems really at all, um, and or an afterlife at all. Uh, he, he characterized the afterlife as really being a secondary concern because religious experiences should be revealed in something in our own active lives, uh, which is perhaps relevant for this week. Um, and the other thing is he, he says he wants to focus on personal religious experiences, so sort of like spiritual experiences, uh, mystical experiences, transcendental experiences, and he, he ser searches out the most extreme examples of those in order to really like uh, show what that is like in, in a very glaring example, not in a, this is like something you might have felt one time, but like a very different um, example. So here we go. Uh, when other people criticize our own more exalted soul flights by calling them nothing but expressions of our organic disposition, we feel outraged and hurt. For we know that, whatever be our organism's peculiarities, our mental states have their substantive value as revelations of the living truth, and we wish that all this medical materialism would hold its tongue. And he goes on, and he, so he's sort of talking about this idea of his understanding of neurology and neuroscience doesn't fully explain um, the, the spiritual experiences others have claimed to have had, and that he intimates that he has had on some level. In the natural sciences and industrial arts, it never occurs to anyone to try to refute opinions by showing up their author's neurotic constitution. Opinions here are invariably tested by logic and by experiment, no matter what may be their author's neurological type. And so, <laughs> interesting. He goes on, though, uh, to talk about the idea of, like, action, like the importance of action uh, within uh, and our lives, like, like living out spiritual experiences through our lives. Uh, by their fruits you shall know them, not by their roots. Jonathan Edwards' treatise on religious affections is an elaborate working out of this thesis. The roots of a man's virtue are inaccessible to us. No appearances whatever are infallible proofs of grace. Our practice is the only sure evidence, even to ourselves, that we are genuinely Christians. And he's, he's not suggesting that everyone is. And he even goes on to say that a person's um, individual experiences and like individual background and life create a path for that person that leads them to perhaps be more predisposed to a, a, a spiritual experience and that others will not have had that path and therefore the, the exact same um, situation will not induce that type of, of thinking for them. Uh, <laughs> this one was interesting. The completest religions would therefore be those in which the pessimistic elements are best developed. They are essentially religions of deliverance. The man must die to an unreal life before he can be born into the real life. He quotes Tolstoy, Faith is the sense of life, that sense by virtue of which man does not destroy himself but lives on. And goes on to comment that, Though not many of us can imitate Tolstoy, not having enough, perhaps, of the aboriginal marrow in our bones, most of us may at least feel as if it might be better for us if we could. And that, that gets at this interesting idea where he goes into, because he's looking at extreme examples of spiritual mysticism, spiritual experience, spiritual conversion, in a way that uh, reminds me a little bit of Stephen Jay Gould's theory of punctuated equilibrium, where you have long periods and then there's a sudden shift and a sudden change. And that's how he, how James pictures conversion experiences or mystical experiences is there's a lot going on underneath that we don't see any evidence of. And then suddenly there's this massive shift um, in, in uh, like certain biochemical reactions. I, I was thinking of the phrase activation energy, where there's, there has to be something that occurs and there's this massive shift that creates this chemical reaction uh, to a different state. And that seemed like what James was describing. Uh, he, he quotes um, Jonathan Edwards, the great Great Awakening uh, minister, famously of sinners in the hands of an angry God, and I suppose now just as famous for being uh, referenced in one of the Hamilton lyrics, uh, and wait for it, he was a grandfather, I believe, of Aaron Burr. Uh, so Edwards, I am bold to say that the work of God in the conversion of one soul, considered together with the source, foundation, and purchase of it, and also the benefit end and eternal issue of it, is a more glorious work of God than the creation of the whole material universe. 
and James adds, there are, this is an important passage, I think, for showing the idea of the, the personal nature of spiritual experiences that James is trying to get at. And this is, uh, there are higher and lower limits of possibility set to each personal life. If a flood but goes above one's head, its absolute elevation becomes a matter of small importance. And when we touch our own upper limit and live in our own highest center of energy, we may call ourselves saved no matter how much higher someone else's center may be, a small man's salvation will always be a great salvation and the greatest of all facts for him. And we should remember this when the fruits of our ordinary evangelicalism look discouraging. And I think that's where James is trying to, to impress this upon. Remember, he's in Edinburgh, so he's giving this lecture to, <laughs> to the, the intellectual descendants of the Scottish Enlightenment. And he goes into discussions around empiricism and uh, he never quite goes right out and like points out that Hume's uh, theory of, of empiricism itself cannot be empirically proven. And, and James himself was, was a strong empiricist, but he, he points out that there are, in his opinion, um, there are, there's more to the world than just what, what we can see and simply measure. And But this, this idea is very important where uh, he says, you know, because we're all different, we're all at these different points, like we, we each reach this certain potential. And when we're there, it's the most precious, the most incredible feeling in the world. And it's not necessarily valid to try and go and compare uh, one's experience to someone else's because the, the background and the life experiences are so different. Um, let's see. Uh, this was another interesting passage. When the sense of estrangement fencing man about in a narrowly limited ego breaks down, the individual finds himself at one with all creation. He lives in the universal life. He and man, he and nature, he and God are one. That state of confidence, trust, and union with all things following upon the achievement of moral unity is the faith state, which I think is kind of an interesting comparison when we think of sort of the, like, uh, faith is, you know, belief in things that... that cannot be shown or cannot be proven if, if we think of like the letter to Hebrews in the New Testament um, that that idea of the faith state is quite a bit uh, different I would say in James's opinion but he goes into he goes in and, and, and lists all sorts of conversion experiences and mystical experiences and he looks and he says okay are these important like are these useful like there have been very bad things that have happened due to you know religious belief and he doesn't list them and catalog them the same way that he has other experiences but he does admit that and then he goes to uh, question okay when you kind of weigh them what do you end up with and he ends up with this interesting idea that a, a mystical person will uh, will reach different potentialities within a society or within a social structure that become very important for that structure, for that society. Uh, but he does point out <laughs> that when, when you take asceticism or certain practices to their extremes, you end up with individuals who, and, and of course, he's trying to just list extreme examples as much as possible within his text and his lectures. But he, he points out that there are certain issues that come about with that. <laughs> his way of expressing is, um, it is better that a life should contract many a dirt mark than forfeit usefulness in its efforts to remain unspotted. And so there we get a hint of the pra pragmatic William James there. This idea of he, he lists someone who like basically almost refused to live life uh, and was held up as a saint. And then he goes, OK, but what would happen if we all did that? <laughs> uh, and and he, he just raises these types of questions. And he towards the end, um, as he's reaching his conclusion and, and kind of picking at what he regards as the limits of philosophy. He has this. The science of religions would depend for its original material on facts of personal experience and would have to square itself with personal experience through all its critical reconstructions. It could never get away from concrete life or work in a conceptual vacuum. It would forever have to confess, as every science confesses, that the subtlety of nature flies beyond it and that its formulas are but approximations. There is in the living uh, act of perception, always something that glimmers and twinkles and will not be caught, and for which reflection comes too late. And I think that sort of becomes his, his point. He's listed this massive mosaic, and he kind of, he, he comes down on a side at the end, and he came out on a side at the beginning, and he comes down on that side at the end, um, 
But of course, if, if you disregard transcendental experiences, this book is not going to do anything for you. Um, you, you might, it might be historically interesting, um, but it, I don't think this book is going to change anyone's mind. You know, you're going to come to it, and, and I came to it, with preconceived notions, and there were aspects of James that I thought were really interesting. There were arguments I hadn't necessarily thought about, but I don't know that it was a book that changed my mind or would change anyone's mind. I don't know if he was trying to do, I'm, I'm sure he was trying to do it, but I think he really was more interested in trying to lay a, a lay out a, a lot of evidence that people need to think about before they come down on the side, perhaps is really what it is. And say, okay, you can agree with this or disagree with this, but you need to understand that this is a very real experience for many people before you, you know, make your statement and take your stand. So it was interesting. One, one of the things that I appreciated about it was it drew out a lot of different uh, um, spiritual thinkers. George Fox uh, kept popping up. Tolstoy kept popping up. But it, it, a number of the uh, you, ministers from the U.S. came out um, and have uh, sermons within the Library of America, American Sermons volume. So Jonathan Edwards, of course, uh, William Ellery, Dr. William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian minister, not Ellery Channing, the transcendentalist poet. Um, let's see. Uh, a number, you know, he has a lot of Christian mysticism, so St. Teresa is referenced frequently. And so the library, um, the modern library, has the essential writings of Christian mysticism. This was a book that felt uh, very much of a piece with some of the, the primary sources William James was listing. He doesn't stick to uh, Christianity, he, he does bring up Hindu and Buddhist thought, and, and just a little bit from Islam with uh, Muhammad. He, he does, uh, the Viking Portable World Bible is a good sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say like beginner's volume to get an understanding of some of those, some of the religious thought in there. And I think that having read that, that helped me appreciate some of James's arguments more. And he, James is, is in He's not necessarily a transcendentalist, but he's very much informed by the transcendentalist thinking. And certainly Ralph Waldo Emerson is a huge part of that. And I suppose if you're thinking, you know, James, you're probably thinking, uh, you know, the, the James siblings. And of, of all the works that Henry James wrote that I've read, I think his sort of like ghost short stories are the ones that feel closest to the type of experiences William James is listing in his, um, you know, mystical and spiritual experiences. And so the Jolly Corner, I have it in collected stories, but I think it's in some other volumes I have. Uh, maybe American Fantastic Tales, Volume 1 from the Library of America. But like those ghost stories of Henry James feel of a piece. So that was uh, The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. I do encourage anyone to you know, give it a shot. I read it uh, usually doing about a lecture a night um, over about a three week period, not consecutively because life happened, things happen. Um, but it, it certainly asked a lot of questions and I don't know that I've answered all of them. I don't think James answered all of them, but that's the point of certain texts is just to ask the questions. So there's my maybe midrash nonfiction. And again, I hope everybody's well. I hope everybody's safe. Uh, I hope your families and those you know are safe with everything that's going on. So thank you.